Okay, today we are exploring ancient Egypt, and much of, of uh, what I'm going to show you is work that could not have been done by the dynastic Egyptians. So according to conventional archaeology, all of the works of ancient Egypt were created more or less between 2500 BC <coughs> and let's say the time of Christ. But some of this work would have been impossible to have been done by the dynastic people, starting with the Great Pyramid itself. 2.3 million to 2.5 million multi-ton blocks of limestone with a core of granite. The granite comes from Aswan and the limestone is actually from the area. So according to conventional academics, the Great Pyramid was constructed over the course of 25 or maybe 30 years during the time of Khufu. And if that's true, that means that the blocks would have to be cut, moved, and set into place every two minutes. So that's clearly impossible. So obviously what we're looking at is a construction that was found by the dynastic people and then adopted by them and renamed by them. So here you see incredible weathering patterns on the surface of the Great Pyramid. The casing stone, of course, to a great extent is gone. And uh, this weathering, I've been told, is much more than uh, the time period that we think. So this is an early indication that uh, the Great Pyramid is much more ancient than what we've been taught in school. And here again, even more weathering of the surfaces. Uh, this would not simply be the result of wind and sand, but we also see the possibility in the darkened areas of heat, like intense heat, striking the surface of the exterior of the Great Pyramid. Quite a mystery. Also, this is the floor on the outside of the Great Pyramid, and you can see that originally the stones interlocked perfectly together, some of the slabs being more than 40 tons in weight and there are a series of shafts outside the Great Pyramid and in, uh, in fact all over the Giza Plateau that presently descend 40, 60, 80 feet but because when you go down farther you find sand it's quite possible that these shafts are thousands upon thousands of years old and could be originally have been hundreds of feet deep and yet over the course of time with sand blowing they gradually started to fill up. But we'll, we'll also see evidence of uh, machining marks and some of these shafts, when you go more or less out of bounds from, from where most um, of the tour tourists go, they are 14 feet wide by 14 feet, carved into the bedrock. We also find machining marks, as you can see down here, uh, on granite surfaces. This is part of a a causeway area outside the Great Pyramid. Um, it's actually not granite, it's basalt. And the basalt is from at least 300 miles away. So we're going to see not only amazing craftsmanship, but the fact that much of the stone was moved from great distances. And the question is, how was that done? And since for most of their uh, time, the dynastic people only had Bronze Age technology. How is it possible that they could carve into a much harder stone such as this basalt? And so here I am pointing to obvious saw marks. Basalt is 7 out of 10 in terms of hardness, with diamond being 10. Uh, these saw marks appear uh, the saws themselves appear to have cut through these surfaces very efficiently. So we're probably looking at diamond level technology and diamond level technology was not created until the late 19th century AD. So how old are these cut marks? And no, they are not recent. They are ancient. We also saw, uh, find that some of the surfaces uh, are peeling off as if intense heat has been applied. This would not simply be sand and wind and rain, but
but the baking of the surface of the stone, making it separate from the core. So over the course of time, now it's literally peeling off. Also, some of the uh, casing stones, this is the second pyramid, and this is red granite. Uh, and the red granite comes from Aswan, which is 500 miles away. You can see at some point in time, someone was trying to make chisel uh, marks into it to break pieces off. Uh, that could very well be after dynastic times, during the construction of the city of Cairo. Uh, Cairo did not exist, more or less, during the dynastic times of Egypt, but is a later city built by maybe the Christians in the beginning and then the Islamic period. So it's the weathering of these surfaces. Some of these stone blocks of limestone are 40 to 60 tons in weight, and the weathering is extremely excessive. Originally, they were cased in granite. Uh, the granite is gone. We don't know where it is. But uh, this weathering, the extent of this weathering, is very suspicious. And then on the third pyramid, we, uh, we also see that this is granite, and notice the pillowed surfaces. This looks very similar to some of the megalithic walls we find in Peru, <coughs> as well as these knobs or these protrusions. Supposedly the protrusions were done by the original sculptors to be able to raise the blocks and set them into place, but if that's the case, then why are knobs missing from a number of them? So we don't honestly know what the knobs were for. Then we go to the main museum in Cairo, and the box on the right is from the fourth dynasty. You can see it's very rough, it's in granite, it's covered with hieroglyphics. Um, again, very crude execution, and so it's possible uh, that this is from the fourth dynasty, done with dolerite uh, stone hammers, and maybe meteorite uh, chisels, because uh, meteorite uh, material is very high in hard nickel. But then the one on the left, Egyptologists will admit, is older. You can see it's bigger, it's more finely finished, the lid is from the same stone as the box itself, so the one on the left is an example of lost ancient high technology and is older than the dynastic Egyptians. They simply found it and recycled it. And this just shows you the smoothness of the surface, uh, the strange damage marks on it. Uh, but when you look on the inside, it's uh, very smooth. The corners are slightly rounded. And this would be something that would be very difficult to make in the 21st century with our technology. So there's no way that that was made during the dynastic times. That's what we're going to see. We're going to see two different types of technology. That of the uh, dynastic people and that of the pre-dynastic. So here, this ju it just gives you another simple comparison between the dynastic box on the left and the pre-dynastic older box on the right. Notice I don't use the term sarcophagus. The one on the left was a sar uh, sarcophagus, but the one on the right was larger, and its original function is completely unknown to this day. And inside the museum, there's a box uh, that was being made. And again, the lid was always uh, cut from the same piece of stone as the box itself. So here we see actu actually a technical uh, technical mistake where the lid of the box was being cut and then the saw started to move inwards into the box and that caused the lid to snap off or at least one third of the lid and the project was simply abandoned. Then on the lid of another box we see these saw marks going this way and uh, that could very well be a type of bandsaw in use, but again, since it's cutting through granite, it would have to have diamonds encased or embedded in the saw blade, and that was not invented until about a hundred years ago. So how was this done, and by whom? 
Then we have the intriguing schist disk, which uh, they, the uh, academics call a lotus bowl, uh, but in fact was probably part of a machine of some kind, maybe an Im impeller. The unfortunate thing is that it was repaired by the museum staff. It was found broken, and so they crudely repaired it, and when it was originally made, it was probably technically perfect. And this gives you an above view of, uh, of what it looks like. The uh, three lobes of it are not angled in any way. So an impeller would tend to have an angle blade in order to push or pull air or water. So it makes it a very, very curious artifact. We also have other artifacts like this, this lobed bowl. You see the perfect circle in the middle. Uh, this is made of the same material as the so-called schist disk. It's actually a kind of metamorphose clay, so it's quite possible that if you're able to take it out of the, of the uh, display case and tap it, that it would make a ringing sound as if it's resonating to a specific frequency. Also, other objects uh, made of hard stone were found in the same cache as this and the schist bowl at, uh, they were all found at Saqqara. And not 10 or 20 were found, but between 30 and 40,000 of them were found. And this could only have been made, at least initially, on some kind of lathe. And that would involve a motor. This could not be done by a hand lathe with somebody with pedals turning it. This had to have been done high speed and cut likely with diamond tools. Then we find plunge drill holes. Again, that, uh, that technology was not invented until the late 19th century AD, cutting into uh, the side uh, of the top of a box made of granite. And then a quartzite box. Quartzite is metamorphosed sandstone and also has the hardness of 7 out of 10. And the lid, in this case, locks into the box. So that could only have been done using very advanced technology. And a pyramidon. Look at the smooth surfaces. Uh, there's no way that the dynastic Egyptians could have achieved that, uh, that brilliance of a surface because that would involve sandpaper with diamond dust. And uh, diamonds, of course, were found in great abundance in South Africa, probably in the 18th and 19th century. But the important thing to know is that the tool has to be harder than the material. So this is in fact cyanite, which is a type of granite, uh, much finer grained than normal granite, a little bit harder. And the cartouches and other hieroglyphics carved into the surface are relatively crude compared to the flat surfaces. So this object was found, probably already damaged by something, and then the dynastic Egyptians carved the hieroglyphics into the surface. Then, when we get to the Osirion, which is at Abydos, if you look at this stone, this big stone, look at the horizontal cut mark. This, again, is in a piece of quartzite, and so that would have to be a saw utilizing diamond level technology. So, the Osirion is clearly older than the dynastic Egyptians, and was constructed on purpose underground. The uh, vertical columns are made of cyanite, which comes again from Aswan, or the eastern desert in the Sinai, and the wall to the left is made of quartzite from Cairo, several hundred miles away. And the Osirion is very complicated. This is uh, an area somewhat off limits, and uh, what you're looking at um, on the left-hand side is a shaft that actually gradually rises up to the surface. So I think the function of the Osirion could have been an ancient water pump of some kind, pumping water from underground because the Osirion usually has water. You can see the green water, but uh, previously, before they built the high Aswan Dam, water levels would come up and down inside the Osirion. So it could have acted originally, it would have had a, a, a roof over top of it, it would have been completely buried and sealed off. So it could have been an ancient water pump as compared to the 
Egyptologist's uh, explanation that it was some kind of symbolic tomb, which is an expression they use in excess. Whenever they find something mysterious, they call it a tomb. Some were used as tombs, but some weren't. And again, this just shows you, uh, luckily on this day there was no water in it. And uh, again, the giant uh, granite columns, some damaged by later quarrying, and then the quartzite wall in the background with the interesting pillowing that we also see uh, at polygonal walls in ancient Peru. And then look at the cruder construction above it. That's probably from dynastic times. That would be above the roof of this ancient sealed unit. And here we have a scale model of Karnak. Karnak is one of the biggest uh, ancient complexes in Egypt. And it is a combination of dynastic construction and then pre-dynastic. You can see on the left, one, two, three obelisks, then two more, then two more, and I believe there are two more. And look at their relative positioning. It's almost like they're designed and set up in a grid-like pattern. Now they're made of granite, one piece of granite each, uh, in some cases weighing up to 400 tons. So the Bronze Age dynastic Egyptians could not have constructed uh, or carved out, moved, and set these into place. So they are a pre-dynastic aspect that the dynastic people found, and then they built their structures in sandstone, which is a softer material, around it. Now, we see lots of catastrophic damage. Again, this is the base of one of the obelisks. Uh, and you can see that the surfaces here on the east side, uh, the weathering is extreme. The higher up you go, the less uh, weathering there is. And it could be, according to Dr. Robert Schock, a geologist, that 12,000 years ago, there were plasma bursts that uh, erupted from the sun and struck some of these lower surfaces and blew the surfaces off. So from my estimation, this plasma ball would have been approximately 60 feet in diameter and would have gone straight down what is called the sacred original passageway, creating destruction uh, as it went. Also here, to the right of that camera, uh, is a saw mark cut into the granite and that had to have been done with a machine. The hieroglyphics were done later using simple hand tools, but that is clear indication of lost ancient high technology cutting into the granite. And then we find many core drill holes, some of them this size. Uh, core drills with diamond imbe diamonds embedded in the front were only invented in the early 20th century AD or maybe late 19th century. So these again are artifacts from pre-dynastic times and they are in great abundance in places like Karnak and lesser known places like Abu Sir, which most tourists never visit. <coughs> but it's a wonder, wonderment area of uh, lots of signs of lost ancient high technology. So here's a human hand inside to show you the diameter of it. Core drills of that scale were probably only uh, created in the late 20th century AD because you would have to have an enormous drill powering that. So once again, in the lower areas at Karnak, in the oldest part, we see heat scorching of the surfaces. Uh, this is granite, and it's as if uh, the surface has been basically burnt off. So that's another indication of very high heat in ancient times existing at Karnak. And then this intriguing object showing major damage. And it is a type of um, alabaster, which is uh, not that hard. But originally, this was one solid piece of stone. And uh, there are no quarries of this kind of alabaster in Egypt. So it had to have been moved from a quarry somewhere else, possibly Turkey. 
and an estimated weight of that when it was original, um, even if it had been shaped at the quarry and then moved here, would be somewhere between 500 and 1,000 tons. Again, it was one piece of stone. It doesn't look like it now because it's been repaired. And uh, this shows you the, the inner surfaces, that they're actually curved, um, which is quite interesting. And the hieroglyphics on the surfaces are quite crude. So the dynastic people carved the hieroglyphics into this ancient uh, thing, uh, which originally had no artwork on it whatsoever. And that's what we're going to see in the pre-dynastic work, is you don't see artwork whatsoever. Uh, but during the dynastic times, you see, of course, hieroglyphics and lots of art. And once again, showing the damage to the lower part of uh, one of the obelisks. Uh, this is actually on the, I think, the western side. So the eastern sides, in general, were more heavily damaged than the, uh, than the other sides. The, the western side, actually, the least damaged. And so this tells us that the force that struck Karnak came from the east and quite possibly at dawn, almost like the sun would rise and a fireball would strike through the complex. Also, the main axis is supposed to be perfectly east to west, but it's 23 degrees off. And that could indicate that the planet was at a different axis um, prior to 12,000 years ago when the cataclysm, we believe, occurred. So again, more of this strange damage at Karnak. Uh, you can see that the material, the granite, is basically sloughing off. And that indicates, once again, that uh, rapid high heat struck the surface, causing the surface to expand. And over the course of time, the surface layers began to peel off. And again, at the lower part on the left, or actually where I'm pointing, you can see uh, another indication of a core drill hole. And now we're actually almost at the end of the, um, of the main axis in Karnak. And once again, we're going to see extreme heat damage on the stone surfaces. So this is granite, and you can see that it's basically falling apart as if it has been hit by high heat in the distant past and is now gradually crumbling. The different types of stone react to heat in different ways. So here again on the left-hand side, we have another piece of uh, granite that's crumbling. And then uh, in the background is uh, a giant slab of the alabaster, and its surface has basically exploded off. But on the back side, we do see more core drill holes. And again, these can't be uh, things that were done during the dynastic period. So this is another uh, specimen of something that was pre-dynastic found at Karnak when the dynastic Egyptians arrived in the area. That was a tendency. They would find an ancient structure that preceded them and turn it into a sacred site. Then we're at the Aswan Quarry. And the Aswan Quarry is a granite quarry. That's where most of the granite from Egypt was taken from. And here you see dynastic period attempts to break the stone. Slots were created uh, with very hardened bronze that would take a long time to do, uh, possibly even with iron later on. And then they would put wooden uh, shims into the recesses and pour hot water on them. And over the course of time, that would cause cracks to happen. So you'd have a very rough surface created afterwards. But contrast that on the right, which again is the indication of how the dynastic people broke the stone with these strange scoop marks on the left. And the scoop marks are a, cl a clear sign of ancient technology that was uh, prior to the dynastic people. And we're going to see more examples of this as we go along here. So here, more of these scoop marks. And this is the unfinished obelisk at Aswan, which, uh, had it been completed, would have weighed 1,200 tons.
And that's what it looks like. Look at the size of the people compared to the size of the obelisk. It was never completed, which is a mystery. And the other question is, even if they had been able to cut the whole thing out, how would they raise it out of the pit that it's in, since the surface is not flat, it's very much rolling. And uh, granite is actually quite brittle, so it would have to be perfectly balanced as it was taken out of the quarry location, otherwise it would snap easily into two pieces. And here you see the, uh, <coughs> the western trench, and again uh, of the unfinished obelisk, and again these interesting scooping tool marks. Uh, unlikely hand tools. The standard explanation is that they had hardened stone hammers that they used to pound away to uh, remove the granite, but the pounders were only slightly harder than the granite itself. So even creating a channel like that would, would take hundreds of years, if it, if it was even possible. And here, this is a smaller obelisk that was never completed. And you see these interesting deep scoop marks into it. I think those were done by some kind of machine. There's no way you'd have a stone pounder and you'd be pushing in like this trying to remove granite uh, from the surface. Because we actually experimented with that. And I filmed it and it looks quite stupid. Then we see um, here at, um, I think this is Karnak as well, Again, extreme erosion of limestone surfaces, blackening of the surfaces. Uh, wind erosion would simply cause the white limestone uh, to weather, and it would still be white looking, but the blackening indicates intense heat. And then also, these incredible shaft systems at Saqqara in Egypt, and these almost carving, machining carving marks going deep into the bedrock. There are many of these shafts. Some of them are 16 feet by 16 feet in size, and they probably connect to a tunnel system farther down. Also, we have this scorching here. You can see this darkening orange and even brown and black. So again, I think that's an indication of possible solar plasma striking Saqqara. And solar plasma striking a surface like that would vaporize all organic life. So if there were any plants living there, any people, any animals, they would be instantaneously vaporized and the area would not be habitable for probably thousands of years. That is another indication that there were uh, those that did the early construction maybe 12,000 years ago, <coughs> then a series of cataclysms struck and then the area was uninhabitable, uh, uninhabitable until maybe 5,000 years ago. Also, we see more devastating damage done to a small pyramid at, at Saqqara, as if the surfaces have exploded off. Some would say this is damaged by vandals, but it looks more to me like this is intense heat and literally blew the top of this small pyramid off. And here we see more examples of probable heat scorching, uh, shattering of the stone, um, and it does appear that this little pyramid um, was hit at the very top by a very intense burst of heat. And here again, this incredible uh, weathering into the surface uh, and the blackening of the surface, the intense damage. Uh, this is actually the casing stone that's still on the lower part of it. <coughs> but that weathering could not simply have been done by wind and sand. It's something much more devastating occurred here a long, long time ago. And I think that the dynastic people found this little pyramid. They didn't try to repair it, but they did use the interior as a tomb. So inside, we see this box, which could have been used as a tomb. And again, it has strange scorching on the interior. Uh, we couldn't really figure out what kind of stone it was. It's about, interior space is about nine feet long. It would weigh in the region of 60 to 80 tons. And it could be basalt or possibly cyanite, which is a type of granite, which again, could not have been shaped efficiently during dynastic times. 
And uh, this shows you that originally the lid of the box would have locked into it. So not just a lid that went on top, but three-dimensionally locked into it. And uh, that's just one of the curious little aspects that I was looking at in this case. Then also at Saqqara, we have the Step Pyramid of Zoser. And most uh, Egyptologists think that this was one of the earliest attempts of constructing a pyramid, and that later on, once they had perfected their technique, they built the Great Pyramid. But I and others believe that actually the Great Pyramid existed, as did some of the others, and this was a way of the dynastic people trying to copy without having the technological capability of replicating uh, the Great Pyramid itself. They had to build it in a step manner. And next we're still at Saqqara and we are underground at the Serapium, which is a series of two tunnels carved into the bedrock and what we find here and hundreds of feet long. Um, one curious thing is uh, there is no uh, soot or other kind of organic uh, darker material on the surface. So uh, these tunnels were completely pitch black and um, there's no way that the dynastic Egyptians made it because they had at best torches of some kind. No one's bothered to try to clean the surfaces. So this is what these tunnels have always looked like. So it, the impression is that they were made using high technology and that artificial lighting would have to have been done in order to make them. And what we find inside of these tunnels are 25 plus stone boxes weighing 100 tons apiece. So this is one of the Serapium boxes. And uh, the material is cyanite that probably came from Aswan, 500 miles away. The lid is 30 tons, the box is 70 tons. And the sculpting or carving of the hieroglyphics on the surface is much cruder than the box itself. So these boxes were found by the dynastic people and then they etched the hieroglyphics into the surfaces. This just shows you, again, the sense of precision. Uh, the lid would hermetically seal the box. The lid of the box was made from the same piece of stone as the box itself. So originally it would have been 200 tons, and then when completed, 100 tons. So how was it moved from As Aswan? How was it moved to the location? How was it moved into the tunnel? And then how was it moved into the recess that we presently find it in? So once again, this just gives you a sense of scale. You know, there's a standard six-foot human next to uh, one of these giant boxes. One was never finished, and it's in the other hallway. So this is the roughened shape, uh, halfway down the hall. It never made it to its final location, which was a niche. And then we find the lid behind it, about 100 feet away. So this is like trapped in time. Uh, why did they stop work here? We see evidence in many locations uh, of a megalithic nature where work suddenly stops. And so I think that all of this sudden stoppage was of, as a result of an ancient cataclysmic event about 12,000 years ago. So there's the lid, roughened out, never finished, and by the time the box and the lid make it into the niche, how were they planning on doing the finishing work to make it a uh, hermetical perfect seal without having proper lighting and without having advanced technology. Then we are at uh, Tanis, which is located in northern Egypt. What you can obviously see is that this granite lid was recycled because you see partial hieroglyphs and then they abrupt, abruptly end. And then the box itself is made of quartzite. So this is a recycling effort during dynastic times of pre-dynastic workmanship. So Tanis is basically devoid of life. If you look in the background, you see uh, beautiful farmland of the Nile Delta. 
but almost nothing can grow at Tanis, and as you walk on the surface, it's like walking on the moon. It's like walking on flower. So I think this again was a place that was struck by an ancient cataclysm involving heat, quite possibly plasma ejection from the sun, and it basically decimated the site. It would have vaporized any life forms, and there are a handful of thorny plants that presently live there, and nothing else. It's like a wasteland. Also, the hieroglyphics on the left look like they were done with a machine, whereas the ones on the right look like they were done by hand. So the hieroglyphics on the left are pre-dynastic, the ones on the right are dynastic, and that gives us the strong possibility that hi uh, hieroglyphics were not created by the dynastic people, but were an inheritance, and they were reinterpreted by the dynastic people. Same symbols, different symbolism. This piece of quartzite was struck by intense heat because it should be a cream color, but you can see some of the surfaces are melted. So that tells us, again, high heat at Tanis. And then the right side of this face is burnt off. Again, this is quartzite. So this is a pre-dynastic sculpture that was struck by the cataclysmic heat and was found as most of Tanis was found, the sculptures and what was left of the obelisk were found buried underground. Not buried on purpose, but a cataclysmic event that caused the soil to blow up into the air, come back down and settle, tons upon tons of it, and then cover the site over to be discovered by the dynastic people and then occupied. And then most of these works were then unearthed in the 19th and 20th century AD. This is just a detail again of the burnt surfaces of this sculpture with pieces literally being blown off by the intense heat. And another stone that should be creamy colored like on the left side but has been distorted uh, and also uh, some of the material or surfaces turned into uh, glass. This is a foot. Uh, the original sculpture, if it was one piece, would have been 100 feet high. And the quarry at Aswan is 1,000 kilometers to the south. And this was the lid of a giant granite box, again made of the granite from Aswan. This sculpture was blown apart by intense heat. And if you look down where the toes should be, the toes are melted off. And this is a close-up of that. You see the globular glass-like formations. So that was melted by at least 2,000 degrees Celsius. And another sculpture that has been hit by intense heat, uh, darkening the surface, causing melting, causing portions to blow off. Uh, nothing at Tanis is intact. It's all destroyed. Giant sections of obelisks. Uh, there were more obelisks at uh, Tanis than anywhere else in Egypt, probably at least 14 or 15, uh, smashed into pieces. Uh, again, you see eroded surfaces. This column would have been one piece originally, uh, more than 30 feet long. And then the dynastic people finding the remnants of a lost ancient uh, high-tech culture decided to rebuild some sections. That's what you see here. They took the eroded stones and were able to restack them and then do quite crude repair work in the middle of the right-hand side of that wall. And then there are underground features that we're going to explore um, on the Giza Plateau. Only recently opened to the public with the Great Pyramid in, in behind. This is called the Osiris Shaft. And it's a series of shafts that go down 200 feet into the bedrock. Uh, the general public has only been allowed in here since November of 2017. And we paid the fee so that we could have private access for two hours. And ag again, there's the, uh, the second pyramid. So this is the causeway going to the second pyramid and the entrance is underneath the causeway. 
So as we go in, we're in the bedrock. And you look up and you see a metal grate. Um, and as you look down, you're looking to the first level, which is 30 feet underground. And this is the ladder, luckily the new fangled ladder, uh, because the old one was very rickety. So when you get to the first level, it's about 15 feet wide and 30 feet long. And then you come to the ladder that takes you down to level number two. And level number two is 100 feet down into the bedrock. So now we are 130 feet <coughs> excuse me, underground. And there we find six niches in which we find two boxes. This stone box is made of what's called dacite. And dacite is not found in Egypt. It's from elsewhere likely maybe Turkey or somewhere else, but not in Egypt. So it was moved a huge distance. And the interior is filled, uh, a surface film, of this odd black goo, organic-like material. I don't know what it was, <coughs> but um, it looks like it literally exploded from the inside, that there was an internal explosion that blew the lid off to the side. And even more so, is this one, which is the other box. And you can see the massive crack on the side. So I think this suffered from some kind of internal explosion. So the theory is that this was not originally a sarcophagus, but it was an energy device of, of some kind that overloaded and uh, it had an internal explosion. So the final level is another 60 feet underground. And there you can see a pool of water and in that, uh, there is Yusuf Awiyan standing on a giant uh, stone box weighing, in his estimation, 60 to 80 tons. So when we go back the next time, we're going to measure the dimensions of the box and then measure the dimensions of the shaft and see how much clearance there would have been in order to be able to lower this down 30 feet, then 100 feet, and then 60 feet. And what its function was, again, it was not the symbolic tomb of Osiris. The question is not uh, necessarily what was it used for, but how was it made and by whom? So there is going back up to the surface. And now we're in the Valley Temple, which is located in the region of the Sphinx on the Giza Plateau giant slabs of granite from Aswan. And here again, giant slabs that used to fa do the, uh, be the facing of a core of limestone. But again, look at the extent of the erosion of the limestone. So how many thousands of years ago was the uh, granite removed? And was it removed by somebody to recycle? Or was it blown off by some kind of cataclysmic event? Then we're inside the Valley Temple. And you see these giant uh, vertical uh, granite slabs. There used to be uh, cross beams going across it. Uh, the what, look at the weathering of the surfaces. This actually looks like water weathering. And so that means that this temple may have, in ancient times, had water in it. But the question is, where would the water have come from? But we will get into that when we look at the Sphinx. So now we're approaching the Sphinx with the second pyramid in the background. Notice that I call them the first pyramid, second pyramid, and third pyramid, because I think they had nothing to do <laughs> with Khufu, Khafre, and Mankare. They named themselves, or they named the structures after themselves, but there is no way, shape, or form that they made them. So we have this e uh, intriguing thing in front of the Sphinx. You look on the in that direction, that is the bedrock, but then in between the, the uh, t uh, feet of the Sphinx, you have blocks of stone. And then on the other side, the bedrock. So what that indicates is that these blocks were set into place and there is a chamber underneath the paws of the Sphinx, according to what Ed Ed uh, Edgar Casey believed. And then when you look at that rectangular pattern there, that is a rectangular 
platform that can be taken out at any time. So it's believed that uh, they have found the chamber under the Sphinx. There's at least one chamber discovered actually by Robert Schock using ground penetrating radar. And that then they did the excavation late at night and they built this walkway to hide the fact that they have found the chamber, the so-called Hall of Records, under the front paws of the Sphinx. And it has been repaired over the course of thousands upon thousands of years. It's, it's likely that uh, Khufu and Khafre began repairs on the Sphinx, that it is much older, and that is proven by this vertical weathering, which only could have been done with precipitation. And the amount of precipitation it would have taken to do this only existed in Egypt at least 10,000 years ago. So that makes the construction of the Sphinx at a minimum 4,000 years older, or even 5,000 years older than the dynastic people. And that's a close-up of the vertical weathering. The horizontal would have been wind, or sorry, horizontal would have been sand and wind, vertical, rain. And finally, near the back uh, area, the rump of the Sphinx, there is a piece of, uh, rectangular piece of wood that has a grate on it and it happened to be have fallen out the day that we visited and we looked inside and there is a metal ladder that goes down inside the Sphinx making it quite possibly hollow to some degree so there is at least a shaft inside the Sphinx and possibly a series of shafts and tunnels and so the mysteries of ancient Egypt continue. This is at the Ramesseum, located near Luxor. And originally it was a single statue made of one single piece of stone weighing a thousand tons. And it is in multiple pieces. We see scorch marks on it. We see the peeling off of stone. So this likely as well was um, a victim of an ancient cataclysm that struck the area, wiped out the first high-tech culture, and then the area was left abandoned until the dynastic uh, Egyptian people arrived some six or maybe even 7,000 years later. <laughs>